warmest greetings to all comrades of the MCP. It's been a minute, hasn't it? Thank you all for your continued support in this period of inactivity and for everyone keeping things tipping over. Today's video is on an important topic which has been vindicated by my experience having to come into the city to study since September. I have scoured YouTube for material on this topic but there is little nuanced content, only stuff from infographic show level brain rot and there is a clip from Haz expressing God support from Pol Pot and someone who goes by the name Adolf Stalin who defends him but that is about as far as it goes. It seems as though nobody is willing to touch this matter with a 10 foot pole, even those calling themselves communists, especially the red lib buys or fake MLs on reddit who may be willing to accept Stalin or Mao but only infrared and those adjacent will venture to defend Pol Pot. I don't claim to be doing anything original today, all this information is in archives and online for you to read, but there is little in the way of video content on this topic, so I will seek to present what exists already in a more digestible way. Part 1. The Cambodian Genocide Debunked Section A. The Death Toll Before getting into the nuances of the aims of democratic Kampuchea, we must first address the outrageous. The notion that Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge were responsible for the deaths of 2 million people by execution, or even half the national population as some claim. Where does the figure of 1.7 to 2.2 million killed come from? The death toll was calculated by Ben Kiernan, author of The Pol Pot Regime. His estimate comes from surveys asking families how many of their relatives died during the democratic Kampuchea period the chief of which being a survey by Stephen Hedder, which was carried out on refugees on the Thai-Cambodian border in 1980-81, claiming to show a death toll of 20% of the population of Kampuchea in the democratic Kampuchea period, which Kiernan uses to claim that 1,671,000 people died. Kiernan arrived at this figure by extrapolating deaths from the surveys as a proportion across the Kampuchean population as a whole. Now, this is a poor method because refugee surveys are inherently unreliable. Obviously those pushed to flee as refugees are more likely to come from the regions that suffered the most from violence or hunger than what would be the country's average. Another funny thing to point out when we're talking about refugees and migration, more people migrated from the Vietnamese puppet regime than from democratic Kampuchea per year. However, even assuming refugee surveys to be representative of the general experience, Dr. Hedder himself, in an email exchange in 2011, claimed that the figure presented did not deduct the normal amount of deaths which could be expected to occur in the period, so did not count as an excess death toll, and it certainly could not be said that all in this number died due to execution, even if we supposed that this extrapolation yielded a reliable number, which it certainly does not. Kiernan cited a pre-democratic Kampuchea death rate of 1.86% per year. Now subtracting this from the 20% for the years the Khmer Rouge was in power would give an excess death rate of about 13% of the population. But this is supposing that the death rate before is correct. Yet a survey by Derwell Chur shows that the death rate was expanding rapidly in 1974 before the Communist Party of Kampuchea ever took over and that the death rate actually began a steep decrease before they were ousted from power. This means that the 1974 death rate was actually a lot higher than 1.86% even if this was the average for the whole 1970-74 period. Which would of course make sense with the US dropping 2,756,941 tonnes of bombs on the country. And Kampuchea suffered over three times the amount of bombs dropped on Japan in World War II. It may be the most bombed country in all history. This also demonstrates that the Khmer Rouge brought the death toll down massively once death rates had peaked at the midpoint of the regime, which were for reasons that were already in existence and which they inherited, and were then seen to successfully solve. Other methods of extrapolating between censuses that were 36 years apart to try and get a death toll for a four year period are basically pointless. 
Pointing to horrendous looking stacks of skulls from the so called killing fields is useless too, as we shall explore in the next section. A Finnish inquiry determined that one million or fewer people actually died under Pol Pot, thousands of those being during the clashes with the Vietnamese military. It is likely that the number of those executed was closer to somewhere between 30 and 50,000, according to the paper Democratic Kampuchea Theses on the Cambodian Revolution 1975-78. The same source claims that between 1975 and 1978, about 500,000 died over and above the natural mortality rate. The overwhelming majority died of starvation and disease in the immediate post-war period. Of those actually killed, these were in the main not a result of an official policy of the central government in Phnom Penh, but were grassroots reactions in the rural areas. There was indeed an initial central imprisonment and some executions of Lonol officers, but two decrees were issued by the central government one in May 1975 and the other in October 1975, both ordering a stop to all killings and acts of revenge. Another famine started after the invasion by Vietnam, however international aid was already too late. A United Nations survey determined that 500,000 people died directly from hunger in 1979. We do know that the population was 6.56 million in 1970 and 10.25 million by 1995. Now, if 1 million died due to the US and 500,000 in the war with Vietnam, for the Khmer Rouge to kill a further 2 or 3 million during their time in power and their population still to reach 10.25 million by the mid 90s would require a huge hike in birth rates whereas due to the turbulent conditions, it almost certainly decreased. The massacre simply did not happen. There weren't a huge amount of people died and replaced by even more born. They just simply did not die, and the birth rate continues at a relatively low level. Section B, the mortality rate. Allow us to take a look at multiple statistics given by the World Bank. If the genocide was real, we would expect a higher mortality rate than before. Therefore, we should have seen adult mortality to rise massively during the period of democratic Kampuchea. But there is no increase, rather a massive drop from 87 deaths per 1,000 inhabitants in 1975 to 19 deaths per 1,000 inhabitants in 1979. Concerning infant mortality, it fell massively in 1979 after having reached its highest point in the 1975-1976 to period after an increase having taken place before the takeover by the Khmer Rouge. The infant mortality rate fell down from 180 in 1975 to 130 in 1978. Regarding the death rate, we can go back and see that it got cut in four after its highest point in the 1975-76 to year, and that it stagnates during the Vietnamese puppet period. All this whilst there is an increase in life expectancy from 12 years to 37 years in a period of just two years. This positive development can be found in the multiplying of the clinics by the government of democratic Kampuchea and the elimination of diseases like malaria, coupled with the construction of water irrigation systems. In summary, the Kampucheans saw their conditions deteriorate for a decade before the revolution, and after the installation of the Khmer Rouge, things completely collapsed due to these mounting factors. This was that 1975-76 to year. But soon after the socialist government began implementing methods to solve all these problems, an improvement was seen for a brief moment before the Vietnamese invasion and the establishment of a revisionist government happened and things only stagnated. According to forged journalists and the delegation of the Canadian communists who visited democratic Kampuchea, 80% of the malaria that devastated the country had been wiped out and the infant mortality rates were similarly reported to have been radically reduced. 
In the 1960s, they said that the rate was 127 per 1,000. Under Democratic Campuchia, it had dropped to 13 per 1,000. Section C, the killing fields. There is no reliable evidence of the nature of the many remains seen stacked up in the so-called killing fields. But it is certain that these are not all there because these sites were where people were killed on the spot and dumped, as the ludicrous killing field claims say. The CPK had prohibited cremation, which meant that all of the dead had to be buried, or as was the common practice, just laid out above ground, often in the jungle, whether these deaths were due to execution or any other natural cause. It's definitely not the case that all the corpses buried or stacked together were victims of Khmer Rouge executions. Forensic examinations show only a very small percentage of remains display any signs of violent death. Polonen examined three sites which were apparently killing fields. At Kampong Spu, he examined 100 crania and found evidence of violent death in one case. Of several hundred long bones, he found 13 showing signs of violence. At Pomherle, Polonen examined several hundred long bones and crania. He found evidence of violence in eight of the long bones and two crania had gunshot wounds. At the memorial site at the ruins of Sang Prison, Polonen examined piles of human skeletal remains topped with 50 crania. He found no evidence of violence or violent death in a single one. Despite this, the Royal Court of Cambodia's Demographic Experts Report claims that 50% of all excess deaths in Democratic Kampuchea were due to violence, which is simply baseless. Mass graves these certainly were, but sites of executions, we have no evidence of this. A visit to these sites yourself will not enlighten you with much, as little evidence of anything happening at them is forthcoming. The museum at the supposed killing field in Chuang Ek, where the alleged victims were killed and buried, is very woolly indeed. One plaque says that the Khmer Rouge guards would bring some 20 to 30 detainees twice or thrice a month and kill many of them. For three years it would amount to less than 2,000 dead. But another plaque in the same museum said that they dug up about 8,000 bodies. And another plaque said that there were over a million killed. There are no photos of any killings, instead only paintings and reconstructions exist. Other plaques read, Here the murderous tools were kept, but nothing remains now, and similar inscriptions. Nothing very substantial anywhere. Pol Pot killings are a fictitious horror story cooked up with other CIA-sponsored narratives like the Holodomor. The aim is to hide their own atrocities, the millions of Indo-Chinese they napalmed and bombed. Kampucheans do say that many more people were killed by the invading Vietnamese in 1978, whilst the Vietnamese prefer to shift the guilt, of course, onto the Khmer Rouge. Prince Sihanouk, who was exiled by the Americans, also supported the Khmer Rouge. The official story of Khmer Rouge alleged atrocities is entrenched in Western conscience, though attempts to find evidence of these bear scant results. The Vietnamese planned to create an Indo-Chinese federation, including Laos and Kampuchea, under their own leadership. They were about to become a hegemon in Southeast Asia, fully aligning with the USSR against China. The USSR got India on board with containing China, so Mao ended up being surrounded by hostiles on all land borders. In the midst of this, Mao found a great friend and ally in Pol Pot, entering into mutual defence against a revisionist bloc with democratic Kampuchea. But this balance was broken when Vietnam attacked the country and occupied it, ultimately leading up to the Sino-Vietnamese War. The Vietnamese invaded and overthrew the Khmer Rouge, who were too keen on their own independence. They also supported a myth of genocide to justify their own bloody intervention. All supporters of Mao should clearly side with Pol Pot and Democratic Kampuchea, the man who returned to village tradition and from there sought to build a new country from scratch. Which leads us nicely on to part two, the evacuation of the cities. Section A. Backdrop of War. The US-Indochina War was horrendous. 
The day after the Phnom Penh coup, Lon Nol approved the US military to dispatch a huge fleet of B-52 aircraft for carpet bombing on the Ho Chi Minh Trail in eastern Kampuchea. Even the report of the Finnish Inquiry Commission confessed that by 1975, about 10% of the population of Kampuchea, about 600,000 at minimum, had already died as a result of US carpet bombing of the countryside, with the hope that the Viet Cong bases would be taken out. Now, if the excess death toll was 13%, and 10% of that was contributed by the US, that would mean only 3% of the excess deaths were due to the democratic Kampuchea regime. Michael Clodfelter and David Wolachinsky put the deaths at 900,000. At the very least, going by the conservative estimates, at least one in seven Kampucheans died due to US intervention, and these were all counted as killed by Pol Pot, in that 20% figure you often hear. This is why the United States initially opposed the trials of the Khmer Rouge. Quite simply, they did not want what they had done to be exposed. They dropped more bombs on Kampuchea than they did Nazi Germany, three times the amount as on Japan, and they smothered the rest of the country with mines. This is why, if asked to name their greatest destroyer, it is Kissinger's name that the Kampucheans give, not Pol Pot's. The result of this was that not only were people dead immediately, but a further two million were made refugees, and swarms of cities to flee the Dresden conditions of the countryside. In 1970, the population of Phnom Penh was about 500,000, but in 1975 it reached 2 million, accounting for nearly one third of the total population. Whilst the US was destroying the fields and livestock, the country became dependent on US food aid. This US food aid was cut off when Lon Nol fell. Barely anyone planted rice in 1974, and output fell by 80%. American reconnaissance planes found that only 12% of rice paddies were still planted. The bombing destroyed up to 50-60% to of livestock in some areas, as well as 90% of the houses and 70% of the rubber yielding forests. People had to pull plows from cells because their animals were dead. The Khmer Rouge inherited the poorest country on earth at that time, facing mass starvation where a third of the population were refugees. According to Long Barrett, the old government's last premier, Phnom Penh had only eight days left of rice on the eve of surrender. To prevent the situation from worsening, food production had to resume. If not, there could have been an enormous famine, killing millions. The solution wasn't beautiful, but it was necessary, forcing people to farm. The capital was evacuated so food production could begin again. Democratic Kampuchea was not so set on autarky that they were willing to let their people starve until they'd reached sufficient food production levels. Philip Short shows how they did accept food aid from China, and if they had started accepting aid from other sources, they risked their Chinese aid being cut, as China had done to Vietnam, since China themselves did not have large surpluses of food at this time. Accepting food aid from hostile powers could have caused a dependence which could be cut at any time for political reasons, a scenario potentially leading to even more deaths. The policy of repatriating refugees to the countryside was an objective success. In 1976, Kampuchea's grain output doubled to 1.8 million tonnes, making the country self-sufficient in grain. In a year, Kampuchea had managed to get plenty of rice, enough to feed all and even to sell some surplus to buy necessary commodities. Industry and agriculture recovered rapidly. A large number of schools and hospitals were built. There was a hospital for every 100 families. Take a look at the documents surviving from the party centre meetings in July 1976 to see their plan. Even Kiernan records the CPK's call for socialism in all fields, and how they set out their plan from a basis of agricultural produce to provide the income needed by democratic Kampuchea for autarkic economic growth. They simply didn't have many other resources in the country. The plan called for the doubling of rice production by the end of 1980, the income being used to purchase more agricultural machinery and other industrial equipment. The plan sets out how socialism could build their light industry, 
Aspen Heavy Industry, Communications, Transport and Telecommunications in order to punctually provide for the increasingly high living standards of a people. They did not want to take Campuchia back in time or return to a hunter-gatherer society as the stereotype might have you believe. Even the capital city was not completely empty. There were still around 50,000 people who remained in Phnom Penh. Andrew Murphy, in his book, Brothers in Arms, Chinese Aid to the Khmer Rouge, states that there was a section of the city where the foreign embassies were set up, as well as the shops that these diplomats were able to visit. Various factories, warehouses, hospitals, motor pools and logistics stations were scattered around the city. So it was certainly not empty, and the various ministries that were set up would usually mean that top officials and their families may also be relocated to the capital. The airport remained functional, and to some degree became a central hub for the government. Zone leaders and party cadres would be summoned there, likewise foreign dignitaries who visited were met there. Even some technicians and similar were actively picked out of a crowd leaving Phnom Penh, not for imprisonment or execution, but to work back in Phnom Penh and keep things going as it were. Section B. Pol Pot's aims. Pol Pot is often attacked as a peasantist or anarcho-primitivist and used as a way to attack Mao by proxy. In defending the Maoist reliance on the peasantry, we as supporters of Mao must defend Pol Pot, at least in his motives. Pol Pot was not a primitivist as he is often conceived. Now, the Campuchian revolution was very bloody indeed and ugly, and it was filled with excesses on some of the local levels which we do not necessarily deny, although the extent of them certainly demands serious investigation and should not just be presumed as a fact. But indeed, Campuchia may have seen the most excesses in the history of communism in terms of what happened to individual groups of people in specific instances. Granting this, so much bloodshed may have arisen because of a certain literalism within the thinking of the Khmer Rouge, a finer point distinguishing it from the more refined Chinese path. The same problem was seen in the early years of the Russian Revolution too. Class struggle does not always need to take the form of literally killing the enemy. We even see this excess rear its head in the early years of Chinese land reform, although how much of this was the CPC's plan, or just the permission given to let people violently sort out their grudges to maintain the initial power, it's a matter of discussion. But this is similar to the situation with the Khmer Rouge, where the discipline in a local area would largely depend on the personal character of a village chief. As experience matured, it has been seen that conditions can be created to render this literal class struggle as superfluous. The enemy can be outmoded as a class. This is exactly what Iran did too, with a comprador class under the Shah. In the case of Pol Pot, the same dialectic is present. His true idea was not primitivism as some kind of end goal, but that the need to evacuate the cities was not due to being against modern industry, but to be able to set it out on a fresh basis. Everyone will go to the countryside, turbocharge the agriculture, and then industrialise from that foundation. This was known as a super great leap forwards, essentially being a four-year plan to grow a bumper harvest, sell it for billions and buy lots of state-owned industry. This parallels the logic of Lenin's anti-imperialism, that the country would be evacuated from colonialism and modernised from scratch on a communist path of industrialization. Pol Pot sought to go to the countryside and from scratch create the requisites necessary for modern industry to create the possibility of an uncorrupted path of development. Year Zero there is a significance to that that we must take on board, whatever the reality of the disputes over the violence. But why was there ugliness and violence? There was certainly some, if not on the scale that is the dogma in the West. The Campuchian experience intensified the very literalistic grounding of this dialectic. It created an extremely strict friend-enemy distinction, and the enemy was often dealt with by outright violence. The mature insight of Mao in the Cultural Revolution is that spiritually somehow the enemy is within, in the ranks of a party, in the tendencies within ourselves, our patterns of thought, customs, habits and culture itself. It is more of an inner struggle, or the inner jihad as it's called in the Iranian Revolution. In Campuchia it was very much an outer jihad. The party was that decentralised that local leaders and lower level commanders had sanctioned to arbitrarily shoot people on the basis of suspicion and paranoia. 
So the problem that we see in Cambodia was this kind of literal political understanding, not in the fact that they had reliance on or gave precedence to the peasantry. The Cultural Revolution also saw similar excesses in the first two years, which Mao of course had reigned in, because the point of it was that after the seizure of political power, we transpose the revolution into the cultural sphere. The place of the inner jihad is properly recognised and not translated into external forms of paranoia and extreme violence. This is the insight of Mao. The inner struggle with the customs, culture, habits and ideas of Western modernity must be struggled with internally. The class struggle within. We must fight the bourgeoisie within our hearts. But there still can be a significance to year zero, the reliance on the peasantry and setting up industry on a uncorrupted basis. This is how we take from Mao and Pol Pot. Section C. Construction and Industrial Achievements. In a speech given on the 27th of September 1978, Pol Pot described the economic development policy of revolutionary Kampuchea in these terms. As far as our industrial development is concerned, we have also worked out a line which aims to develop our industry within the context of an independent economy. Whilst relying on our agriculture, we are developing our light industry and advancing towards a progressive development of heavy industry. The water conservancy projects built in the first half of 1977 alone were able to irrigate 400,000 hectares of land all year round. By the end of 1977, the country's irrigated area had reached nearly 700,000 hectares, and the country's total grain output reached 1.8 million tonnes. It had achieved self-sufficiency in grain and had a small amount of exports. Industrial outputs increased significantly. By 1978, more than 200 factories and workshops across the country had resumed production. The main factories included cement, plywood, glassware, textiles, pharmaceuticals, rubber processing, plastic products, cigarettes and oxygen. At the same time, shipyards, tractor repair shops, agricultural tool factories, etc. were also established. There were more than 30,000 industrial workers across the country. In addition, Many small factories and workshops were established across the country to produce sickles, hoes and other smaller agricultural tools and daily necessities. At the same time, transportation, postal and telecommunication services were also restored quickly. Shortly after, the Phnom Penh to Kampong Seom Railway and 10 motorways with a total length of 2,400 kilometres were also restored and opened to traffic. The stretch of the Mekong River from Krache to Nairang was dredged and opened to ships. Three international air routes were established, Phnom Penh to Beijing, Phnom Penh to Vieng Cham and Phnom Penh to Hanoi. Kampong Seom port resumed shipping with international seaports. By the end of 1977, Kampuchea had established trade relations with China, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Yugoslavia, Romania, Japan, Singapore, Thailand, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Madagascar, Hong Kong, Laos, Vietnam and other countries. Their main export products included rice, rubber, wood, kapok, grain and medical materials. The main imported commodities included machinery and equipment, hardware products, steel products, chemical raw materials, cotton cloth, medicines, medical equipment and other daily industrial products. To say that they had no industrial aspirations is a lie. During the democratic Capuchia period, the Chinese government sent many groups of experts and engineering technicians to help the Kampuchean people repair factories, railways and airports. The education system in democratic Kampuchea featured technical subjects as well as natural sciences and students spent half a day studying and half a day in production. The topic study will be shown on screen now. Living conditions in democratic Kampuchea were better compared to the old regime. People had a higher quality of life in the countryside than they had in the capital. There were improvements in handling of hunger, disease, agriculture and construction. Section D. Morality and Marriage Policies This matter is very difficult to source properly, although the Khmer Rouge stereotypically is often seen as a traditionalist revolution. Factsanddetails.com, not exactly a reliable source, claims that, under the Khmer Rouge, illicit sex was a crime punishable by death, which I take to mean fornication. This is supported by Elizabeth Becker's work when the war was over. It has been claimed by YouTuber Adolf Stalin that divorce was prohibited. 
Now I don't support everything this guy says by any means, but I would be interested to know if this detail is true. I have struggled to find any exact law saying this, but based on the fact that in the general population census of 2008, separation was 0.1% and divorce 2%, I would not struggle to believe it. Pol Pot even frowned upon non-divorce separations apparently, saying that separations nowadays speaking in 1978 that is, um, they were very rare because everyone had a high political consciousness. We also know that the Khmer Rouge was very pro-natalist. Pol Pot said that our policy to increase the population is yielding the appropriate result. In the film Red Wedding by Lee Da Chan and Gui Lam Swan, a speech by Pol Pot can be heard in which he said that a population of 8 million was not enough and that 20 million were needed instead. Some claim that marriages were forced during democratic Kampuchea, but this is false, although marriages had to be agreed by both parents of the bride and groom, and agreed by the state. International Deputy Co-Prosecutor William Smith revealed that the parents of both parties had to agree, and then seek permission by the Khmer Rouge, who also had to agree. Sometimes it was said individual women would approach the Khmer Rouge. The decision-making process was done on the village level. Some authorities did not allow marriages between a couple that were too young. Some other authorities, such as the ones in Kampong Cham, did not authorise marriages until later. There was an incentive for women to marry especially, as it was said that any married woman could stay close to her parents. Many women married so they did not have to work on mobile units. Mr Smith revealed that they were not waiting for the Khmer Rouge to approach them, and that they were willing to marry. Marriages were conducted in mass ceremonies with at least two or three couples attending the ceremony, at the, at the minimum really. Each couple was required to make an oath that they were voluntarily married for Angkar. If there were 100 couples or more, there would be a representative making the oath. Mostly the ceremonies included less than 50 couples. The typical marriage was two to eight couples per day. The sixth revolutionary principle was do not violate women, and in marriage the man, woman and collective had to agree to it. The punishment for violating women was death. An expert Mr Smith consulted said, I don't have enough evidence to say that there was a policy from the top level to organise forced marriages. Conclusion Exonerate Pol Pot I shall end with a quote from Israel Shamir. The Pol Pot that the Cambodians remember was not a tyrant, but a great patriot and nationalist, a lover of native culture and the native way of life. He was brought up in royal palace circles, his aunt was a concubine of a previous king. He studied in Paris, but instead of making money and a career, he returned home and spent a few years dwelling with the forest tribes to learn from the peasants. He felt compassion for the ordinary village people, who were ripped off on a daily basis by the city folk, the comprador parasites. He built an army to defend the countryside from these power-wielding robbers. Pol Pot, a monkish man of simple needs, did not seek wealth, fame or power for himself. He had one great ambition, to terminate the failing colonial capitalism in Cambodia, return to village tradition and from there to build a new country from scratch. His vision was very different from the Soviet one. The Soviets built their industry by bleeding the peasantry. Pol Pot wanted to rebuild the village first and only afterwards build industry to meet the villagers needs. He held city dwellers in contempt. They did nothing useful in his view. Many of them were connected with loan sharks, a distinct feature of post-colonial Cambodia. Others assisted the foreign companies in robbing people of their wealth. Being a strong nationalist, Pol Pot was suspicious of the Vietnamese and Chinese minorities. But what he hated most was acquisitiveness, greed, the desire to own things. Saint Francis and Leo Tolstoy would have understood him. Thank you all for your kind attention my friends. I hope this video shed some light on a topic whose narrative is highly unquestioned and that this can perhaps provide that kernel of doubt in your mind and show things from another perspective. Until the next time comrades, farewell.
教我的努力，起来，全世界受苦的人，满腔的热血已经沸。起来！